everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, whether you're here with us in person or viewing us via the live stream online. We are so happy to have the Interlochen Center for the Arts joining us at the Traverse Area District Library today for a preview of the uh, debut of the new opera, Edmonia. And so I'd like to, um, again, thank our performers and our instructors and help everyone from the Interlochen Center for the Arts for joining us and helping us um, out with this presentation today. And I'd like to go ahead then and turn this over to Justin. And um, we're going to have some presentation. We're going to learn a little bit more about Edmonia, and then we're going to have some songs. So let them take it away. Thank you so much, Justin. afternoon. Uh, my name is Justin Lee Miller. I am the director of musical theater at Interlochen. Um, we have a very special project that we are working on, which is this new, never been done before, premiere of an opera about the life of the sculptor Edmonia Lewis. I'm just curious, we have her picture up here on the screen. Before today, had you ever heard of Edmonia Lewis? Prop Probably not many people. She is a, an American sculptor who was perhaps lost to history and has been recently rediscovered. She, this year she had a US postage stamp made of her and along with that, this opera by Bill Banfield. So we're very fortunate to be doing the premiere of this opera at Interlochen, which will be performed with a couple of guest artists, but mostly the cast is students. We have some of the cast with us today who are going to do some excerpts. I'm directing this uh, as a co-director with Dr. Uh, Laura Osgood Brown, who's the head of the opera program, and I'm the head of the musical theater program, and this has been really a campus-wide project. So we have visual arts, film, interdisciplinary, pop voice, opera, musical theater, theater, probably some creative writing projects too. So we, we are, the full campus is taking on this project. Uh, it is, it has been a daunting task, but we are putting it together. We will have uh, the full Interlochen Orchestra along with a cast of more than 70 students. So I left out dance. Dance also <laughs> plays a really big role in this piece, the dance department. Um, so I would love to give you all some, uh, a sneak peek of some of the songs from this piece. So I would love to start with uh, a song called uh, Soldiers of Love performed by Quinn Welch and Elizabeth Palumbo with Elena Stavropoulos at the piano.
My name is Patty Smith. I teach in the visual arts department. Um, I teach metal smithing and sculpture. And so today I want to talk to, to you about marble and some of the physical qualities, how it's used, and um, the sculptural methods. So, um, as most of you probably know, um, marble actually um, is derived from limestone. So it's a metamorphic rock that through um, extreme amount of time, pressure, and heat um, transformed into um, crystallite uh, crystals, or calcite crystals, excuse me. Um, so in that process, marble becomes harder, it becomes more durable, it weathers um, much better than limestone. Um, extracting marble from the earth is a very arduous task. So I have two images here um, from Carrera, Italy, and one, the top image from the 1800s, um, and that's around the time that Edmonia would have been in uh, Rome um, working and getting her marble from Carrara. Um, the, the way of extracting it would have been through pickaxes and um, chisels and extracting blocks from the earth. Um, again, very time consuming, very expensive, um, and, and then today's, compared to today's methods, Although traditional methods are still used, um, more updated processes are, are used and sustainability is now a bigger part of how the mining happens. Okay, so um, moving on to historical <coughs> significance. Um, marble has been used um, since ancient times, since Mesopotamia and Egyptian times, um, approximately 3000 BCE. Um, and sculptures depicting um, rulers, of mythological figures, gods and goddesses were typically used um, and carved um, through stone and marble. Um, cycladic um, sculptures that I have here um, were carved around um, 2700 BCE. As we move into Greek and Roman art, um, it was a very prized material um, very value, valued, and um, the ability to convey form and structure um, was very prized. Um, many people are surprised to know today that um, sculptures in that time were actually painted. And for around, for about 40 years now, there's been quite a bit of research um, and discovery made in this area. So here we have um, the Trojan Archer, which is a, a Greek statue that has been restored. So this is, on, um, you can see in the white um, where it's, it, the pigment had faded, um, it, it was stripped away, and now what it would look like um, bringing it back to that original state. Um, the pigments were not, you know, um, secured or sealed in any way, so um, it's not surprising that they would have um, either washed away or um, faded in sunlight. Now, in Renaissance times, um, that period, um, artists were very interested in sculpture, and there was a revival of Greek and Roman um, ideologies in art. So artists like Michelangelo really elevate, um, elevated marble sculpting, and you can see with um, the sculpture of the Pietà, the very beautiful draping um, that is conveyed with the fabric and the muscle, muscular, um, uh, the muscles of the figures and the skeletal structure. Um, now, the Renaissance artists were not interested in painting um, the sculptures, and in fact, it's thought that they even bleached some of the sculptures to show the pure material that it was made out of. Some characteristics of marble for sculpture. So marble's fine grain and ability to create polished and textured surfaces make it ideal um, for sculpting. Although it's a hard material, as you're sculpting it, it actually takes on a very buttery, beautiful surface. And tools will just glide right through the surface and into the form. Um, so as you can see here, this is a, a contemporary sculptor, Athar uh, Jabber, 
and his work primarily deals with the figure, but giving it an updated look. Um, so he's very much rooted in, um, in classical ideas. So to get this form, um, tools that are used, um, and I brought tools here today in rough marble that you can look at after the presentation. Um, we would use hammers and mallets and a variety of chisels to work through the surface. Files and rasps are used to smooth out the surface and abrasives to, um, to create even more smooth areas and then eventually polishing um, uh, the surface for a highlighted um, surface. The carving process um, starts kind of slow, I should say. <laughs> um, lately, I've been dabbling in marble carving myself, and I am showing my students um, how to utilize this process. So it's an interesting, um, it's interesting to teach high school students this process, but they're really taking it in, and they're very excited. Um, so. Um, there is a, it is a removal or a sub, subtraction process um, to create that three-dimensional form. You rough out the surface in this top photo, um, roughing out the surface with a point chisel. That's the single pointed chisel. And after that, um, the removal of those high points takes place with tooth chisels, and they kind of look like little forks. Um, the removal of the material um, helps to rough out and to um, create the general form. Um, surfaces are refined with flat chisels and then again further with rasps and files. So this, this process has been used for centuries and still continues to be used this way, but with modern adaptations um, here I have Jason Quigno, a Michigan artist, Anishinaabe stone sculptor. Um, he primarily carves in uh, limestone and granite. And I should mention that granite is quite a bit harder than um, limestone or even uh, marble. Um, it's not uncommon today that artists um, use pneumatic tools, and you can see here in the lower left photo, um, he's using an angle grinder to rough out um, the general form. But the handwork always comes back into it at the end. So um, it, it does help to build a very strong connection to the piece, to the material, to the process. Um, but many of those, those very fine um, tuned surfaces have to be done by hand. Other uh, modern approaches, um, I have Karen Lamont here, um, her cumulus cloud sculpture. Um, this was carved on a seven axis robotic um, chisel. So we don't necessarily have to be um, in the, the motion of chiseling ourselves, but we do now use robotics. And this kind of process has been around for about 20 years. So it's not brand new, but it is being utilized more and more. But again, the surface, we go back to the handwork to smooth out the surface. Um, marble remains timeless, um, a timeless medium for sculpture, cherished by its beauty, um, durability, and expressive potential. Um, it's used, um, it's, it's used in sculpture, it's used in sculpture um, has evolved over centuries, yet continues to captivate and inspire artists and viewers alike. Um, I put a little teaser in here of one of Edmonia Lewis's sculptures, which um, Clyde Sheets will be referencing later on. Um, this is Death of Cleopatra. And so you can kind of see all of um, her, her techniques in terms of the draping and the form, the figure coming out in this piece. Um, after, the ex after the talk, if you'd like to check out tools and um, a finished piece up here, you're welcome to check that out later. And thanks for joining us. All right. So uh, our next example is, uh, is really an example from the score, which is another style. This piece is described by the composer as a um, how would he say it? Um, 
It's, it's a, an opera with different styles. So you'll hear jazz, you'll hear postmodern music, you'll hear contemporary music, inspirational music, um, musical theater feel, gospel feels. There's, there's a lot in this opera. So uh, I would love to give you another example. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Remy Baker.
because they're such a hard act to follow. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Clyde Sheets. I'm the Director of Interdisciplinary Arts at the uh, Arts Academy. Um, I'm also the Instructor of Art History, and I have the good fortune of being a lighting designer and I'm attached to this project as a uh, lighting designer. Today I'm here to give you just a brief history of Western sculpture. We're going to fly over a couple thousand years here in about four slides. So to frame Edmonia within her place, uh, within the Western canon, um, we have to go back to Greek classical. Uh, if you know anything about uh, classical Greece, the, the, the Greeks believed in representing the ideal. That was their, that was their emphasis. They weren't interested in uh, portraying uh, a, a common view of humanity. They they sought to emulate the ideal, and you can see it in their sculptures. The figures, the figures are balanced and proportioned. They have, they, they are absolutely real, but it's heightened realism. Um, we would all dare to dream of the bodies that these, uh, that the Greeks portray. They're, they're muscular. They're fit. They are, they're perfectly proportioned and beautiful. And it is this, uh, this ideal that they seek to project and indeed is projected forward through history. Now, when we start talking about the ideal that they're projecting, we have to also frame that. Because of course, these are Western Europeans. Um, they look exactly like Western Europeans, yet it is a heightened uh, visual. It's a heightened beauty standard that, that uh, well, we could say it excludes a huge portion of humanity. Um, however, this is the Western canon, and this is what was projected forward. The amount of technical skill is, is pretty obvious. Their ability to both sculpt the muscular uh, structure, the skeletal structure, as Patty was mentioning. Also, when you look at the figure on the left, uh, you can see her, her body under the garment. The garment is responding to her physical presence. So this kind of draping is, of course, um, uh, really difficult. It takes, it takes this substance, this, this beautiful, uh, malleable uh, marble that they are all working with to reveal those bodies underneath. So you have, you have the figure and you have these, these uh, draped garments uh, underneath them. Most of what we have from the Greeks is Roman copies because in, as the Greeks were working in bronze, they would, they would create marble statues, um, but they would also uh, create a lot. It's called the uh, wax rem removal method. They would make forms. Um, they would build a sculpture out of wax, uh, compress it into a form, pour it into a bronze statue. So you would have all of these bronzes, but of course the bronzes are lost because once conquest happens, uh, bronzes are melted down. There are a few extant uh, bronze statues of Greek origin that happen to fall off a ship and be found in the bottom of the Aegean. Those have been recently discovered. Um, but for the most part, what we see as a Greek statue and that Greek ideal is carried forward by the Romans and, in fact, emulated uh, to specific detail by Rome. Um, they evolved, the Romans evolved what's called a warts and all realism. Um, and I show this image uh, to give you a sense of, the, of where the Romans took this classical idea, but also to demonstrate the idea of the bust, um, because that's something that's going to become important to Edmonia's work later. So Rome falls. We lose these technical abilities. They, they go away for uh, centuries. Um, and up from the Italian Renaissance, as the, as the information about the Greeks comes pouring into Italy, um, we have a, a Renaissance. We have this rebirth of these Greek ideals. And of course, many of you know Michelangelo's David, um, which is carved from a single block of marble. And that single block of marble was brought down from the mountain just for those of you who don't know, uh, David is 17 feet high. Right? David is a massive sculpture um, with a hairline fracture that 
conservators are praying doesn't eventually give out because um, he has a fracture in his leg. Um, however, this piece of marble is, is using that removal method that Patty was speaking of, um, brought David to life, uh, Michelangelo did. This is the Italians bringing forward this classical idea. I include here also uh, Donatello's uh, penitent uh, Magdalena. This is wood, but this shows some of the biblical um, emphasis of Renaissance art. Um, there's much, there's a lot of other work that happens uh, in mythology, um, but the subject matter is either biblical or commemorative in that moment, meaning these commemorations are about rulers and, and, uh, and generals and, and those kind of things, other than biblical and mythological. Harriet uh, Hosmer uh, is someone who Edmonia meets when she goes to Rome in 1865. This is that neoclassical look. The sleeping fawn is, a, is a, both a Greek and Roman subject matter, mythological subject matter. Um, but you can see the uh, great technical ability that uh, Harriet Hosmer has. Um, and we have to imagine that Edmonia was able to see Harriet's work um, while in Rome. So neoclassical, we don't have, we, we have classical and then the Renaissance uh, brings this back, it evolves into a certain roman uh, romanticism. Um, but the Enlightenment during the 17th and 18th century, we, we reorient back to uh, an emphasis on humanism and this, this desire for pictorial realism. Now that remains in so many ways a pictorial realism based in the ideal, based in that, that beauty standard and those ideals that are really about the Western canon. Um, there are also artists who are seeking to portray a greater emotional range. Um, the French artists are really uh, at the forefront of this. They study in Rome. They bring their ideas back to France and then goes on into the rest of Europe and into the Americas. So I want to just touch briefly on uh, Romanticism. It is about, um, I see my slide cut off here, but it's individualism and emotion. And in the sculptural form, neoclassical is the visual, but romantic is the subject matter. It emphasizes inner emotions. In uh, 19th century United States, um, its large sculpture is largely decorative, but there starts to become a narrative in this sculpture that is almost journalistic. It is telling really specific and small stories. And that's where we, uh, finally find ourselves at Ammonia. Because Edmonia, she told small stories about the world around her and about herself. So she was, she was very self-determined, internationally recognized in her moment before she's uh, largely forgotten for a century. She had mentorship from artists, and we'll look at some of those artists here in a moment. She's largely self-taught because women were not allowed to receive anatomical training. They weren't allowed in the studios where there might be uh, models who were not wearing clothes. And so women were barred from this kind of training, especially uh, as Edmonia is coming up. Those, those restrictions loosen up at the late 19th and early 20th century. She worked uh, in this neoclassical style, she, but she is depicting indigenous peoples. She's in, uh, and she pulls from literature. Um, which we'll see here in a moment. She's also very inspired uh, by biblical characters. She's a uh, practicing Catholic. So going to Rome was really uh, her, you know, she was able to immerse herself in both her religious practice and her artistic practice. Um, there are political figures and African emancipation subjects, and we'll take a look at those in a moment. She did not use assistants in her studio, very, very little. Um, she was really determined to show that she could do the work. She did not want assistants doing the work. And often in these uh, uh, studios where marble working is happening, there is a lot that the assistants would end up doing as the initial subtraction from a block of marble. She did not want help doing that. She did it herself. 
There's a quote that, uh, that Bill has brought to our attention, Dr. Banfield, the uh, composer. Um, Some praise me because I'm a colored girl and I don't want that kind of praise. I had rather you would point out my defects for that would teach me something. Edmonia wished to know. She wished to always be knowing more and being better at what she did. She was an artist who really sought to grow constantly. Quick timeline, so she's born in New York. Um, her father is Haitian, uh, her mother is Ojibwe. Her parents are both passed away by 1853 and she's raised in the Ojibwe nation um, in upstate New York. She attends New York Central College. Her brother has gone to California and made his uh, wealth in the gold rush there, helps pay for her to go to college. She, um, for those of you who don't know anything about Oberlin, Oberlin is the first school to grant education to anyone regard, uh, regardless of race. She falls into uh, a situation where she, she, there's a false accusation. I, I don't wanna talk too much about this as part of the show. So I don't want to I don't want to give too much away. Um, she is exonerated following these false accusations. She moves to Boston and studies under Edward Brackett. We'll look at a little bit of his work today, um, and this connects her to the abolitionists who become her supporters. So, so she really becomes, um, in some ways, part of the uh, abolitionist movement. It's a little more complicated than that, um, but she is. Uh, she is sculpting and depicting um, abolitionists um, and ends up making a good deal of money uh, by selling these uh, items. She moves to Rome in 1865, just about the time that Harriet Hosmer is sculpting uh, the Sleeping Fawn. She also works with Hiram Powers. We'll take a look at his work here in a moment. Um, she eventually moves to London and passes away in 1907. This is Edward Brackett's work, and here we are back to the bust. This, of course, would represent, if I, were, if I were here with my students in the art history class, I would be asking, okay, so what is it about this bust that makes it neoclassical? And the answer is, there is a depiction of ideal, right? This is, this is a man in his ideal, right? On, maybe he looks like this every day. Maybe this is his best day, right? He's having a good hair day, looks great, thoughtful, right? Chin up, looking forward. Um, this is the style uh, in, in, of neoclassical work. Hiram Powers, who she meets when she gets to uh, Rome, um, was a well-known sculptor in that moment. You can see the technical ability that he demonstrates, but you can also see that neoclassical style, that, that ideal figure that he is working in. Um, the, the, he continues to be, he's a supporter of the abolitionists as well. This uh, work of his, The Greek Slave, is used by abolitionists um, to, pr to promote uh, the end of slavery. Then Edmonia creates this bust of Robert Gould Shaw. This is when she's in Boston. Um, Robert Gould Shaw, for those of you who don't know, led the first black regiment in the Civil War. Um, he dies uh, in battle with his regiment. Um, it's the subject of the movie Glory. So again, we have this, we have this treatment of him in, uh, uh, on his best day, right? He, he is in his ideal form. Um, the sale of this bust and then the plaster copies uh, that gets sold in the United States. This funds her trip to Rome. As she continues to grow as an artist, she develops expressive abilities and stories to tell of her own. And this is what I mean by that journalistic approach. There, this is a very specific story about a very specific moment in history. The quote I uh, include here is, and I'm sorry that this got cut off, um, but this is the quote from uh, the Gettysburg Address, and this forever free is our words spoken by Abraham Lincoln during the Gettysburg Address, and that's uh, her inspiration 
for this piece. You can see the depiction of garments. Um, the, often when you see there are other sculptors who commemorate this moment of the, uh, the end of slavery. Um, and they will depict the individual either at Lincoln's feet or in some more subjugated uh, uh, presentation. And she gives us someone who is feeling the moment, right? in the very moment that they become free, representing two generations. Right? He's got his daughter there and himself. This is that kind of storytelling, that journalistic content. She was inspired by Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. In fact, there's a number of her works that are inspired by this. Um, the, the old arrow maker is part of uh, the Song of Hiawatha. And you can again see the level of technical ability that she possesses, the drapery of the fabric. Um, Hiawatha comes to uh, the old arrow maker and delivers the fawn as a gift, which the fawn is part of this sculpture. Her um, depiction of both the older uh, 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 Indian man and his daughter um, give us a sense of generations, much like what we have in the generational uh, picture from Forever Free. She continues to use Hiawatha as inspiration, creating these busts. Edmonia was aware of the market. Edmonia was aware of her place and her ability to tell stories that no one else was telling. She was she, by all accounts, was pretty savvy in getting her work out into the world. Hagar is a biblical subject. Note that she's treating Hagar in a, uh, as, as a European rather than an Egyptian. This is a choice. We don't have a record specifically of why she's making this choice. We know that as, uh, as Christianity spread, it took on the, the uh, look and feel of local populations. The garments are always Roman, and the features morph as we spread Christianity throughout Europe. So what it looks like in by what Christ's image and biblical figures presented in Byzantia are going to look different than they are in France, and they are in Greece. Uh, that is just part of the history of how the, the figures were presented. Hagar is uh, identified as this outcast and fallen woman, um, and Edmonia gives us her in a very sympathetic light. Finally, the death of Cleopatra. This comes to the United States to be uh, uh, exhibited in Philadelphia um, in 1876 for the centennial. It is accepted and exhibited. It shocks and kind of horrifies some of the viewers because Edmonia gives us the moment of death. Rather than, rather than in repose uh, commemorating the moment, we get this very visceral presentation of Cleopatra right after the asp has injected its poison and killed her. This was really shocking in 1876. However, she was also praised for her technical ability. And you can see, as we were looking at the Greek work, you can see her ability to place the body under the garment. The, the garment drapes because of the anatomy beneath. And that's the amazing technical ability that she had. This sculpture goes on an odyssey, ends up in Chicago. Um, it is then, uh, lives in a saloon for many, many years. A race horse owner and racetrack owner purchases it from the saloon to use it as a tombstone for his dead horse, Cleopatra. So it then lives in the middle of a racetrack. It is essentially abandoned there. Um, 
finds itself in a mall, in a storage area, not unironically covered in Thanksgiving decorations. Um, some Boy Scouts clean it up. They actually paint it white. Um, they had no idea, but when they clean it up, they discover the signature. And an art historian who'd been trying to find this piece for many years discovers it, and it now lives at the Smithsonian. Thank you. All right. I would um, like to um, call to the stage uh, our next performi uh, performer, um, Imani Makasa, who plays the role of young Edmonia. And, yes. and we will, are going to get the, the final aria before Edmonia decides to leave Oberlin and go off into the world and start her career as an artist. We would like to thank you all for coming today. Um, we have time just for a few more questions. If we could, if we could have our faculty come back up and we can an answer any more questions that you have about the project or any questions about uh, the life of Edmonia Lewis. Any questions out there? Not much. Well, oh, oh we have a question in the back. Yeah, certainly she, uh, and this is a part of the opera as well, she lived in um, a community of artists in a house that was owned by um, Charlotte Cushman, and she lived with other artists for a certain period of time. Later she had her own studio in Rome, and um, she never wrote a mem. there's no memoir, there are, there are only scattered bits and pieces about her life that are, are really still being discovered. And so we don't know a lot about the end of her life at all. Um, what survives is some works, and I imagine even in time, more works will be found as well. 
So I can't say much about her reception. I can say that she, she was friends with Frederick Douglass. I'm sure many of you have heard of Frederick Douglass. And I know from, from reading Frederick Douglass's later autobiographies that he also lived in Europe for a time. And many African Americans went to Europe because it was just easier to live. And they were a bit of a, a novelty and a bit of a celebrity and something different. And of course, there was no segregation. There wasn't anything like that. There was no reconstruction. So it was easier for them. And I think there are successive generations of African American artists who went there. You know, Richard Wright went there, and you know, Joseph Baker went there, and James Baldwin went there. It seems like every 10 years, somebody went there and, and, and had a, an experience. So perhaps Edmonia was one of the first, among the first. Any other questions? Sure. That's a good question. Um, I know in the story, um, at, that we're depicting in the real life of Edmonia Lewis, she started as uh, doing sketches, as a sketch artist, and drawing. And her early works are drawings. Um, when she started sculpting, that's a good question. Patty, did you want to add something? Yeah.
say what's unique about her life is she she her parents weren't enslaved she was not enslaved she was born in upstate New York she was educated went to college moved to Italy lived much of her life in big cities and she belonged to a tiny tiny minority of independent, educated, African-American women who did what they wanted with their lives. So I think that kind of, that she was one of these early people drew Bill Banfield, the composer, to her story, because how did she exist and we never heard of her? And I think if, if we want to connect her to someone in history, she's really, her life is really closer to Phyllis Wheatley, the, the poet, I don't know if people know that name, Phyllis Wheatley, because once she received her education and training, a lot of what she explored was this European tradition of, of classicism, of the Greeks and the Romans. And that was very similar to, to, to Phyllis Wheatley's work. Now, Phyllis Wheatley is like two or three generations older than her. But um, she is not like your Sojourner Truths or Harriet Tubman's or other people of this period. She's something else entirely different. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I, I think we'll wrap. Oh, one more? Great. Well, I may have a question. How long did you start? According to the slides, 1907? Yeah. Okay, well, great. Thank you all for coming today.